I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish, I didn't have time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. Why, I wondered why God didn't show me. He answered, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I tried all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early one morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. We've been talking about prayer's powerful potential over the past several weeks. And for the last three weeks, or the last three lessons anyway, we have been uh, talking about principles for powerful prayer. And we've talked about four so far. Uh, living a righteous life being devoted to prayer, being watchful in prayer, and um, <clears throat> having a pure heart. If we have these four things, then while not guaranteeing a blank check, so to speak, before God, it, we are guaranteed that God will listen to our prayers and that He will respond to them in a very powerful way. Again, it doesn't mean that He's always going to do exactly what we ask. We talked about God's five answers to prayer as part of this series as well. Uh, and He's not always going to do just what we ask Him to, but He will respond in some way, in some, in some form or fashion. God will listen and God will respond. Today I want us to consider the question, how do I pray? So there are many people who, uh, who believe that there is a set formula and that if you want your prayers to be heard by God and acted on by God, that you have to pray in this specific formula and use these exact words and so forth for God to hear. Well, honestly, I don't think that there is a wrong way to pray, provided that you meet those qualifications and prerequisites that we've been talking about. But some people don't pray at all, or they pray very little. They uh, might say, well, God knows everything anyway, so why do I need to tell him anything? He already knows. What's the, what's the big deal? Why do, I, why do I need to tell him things? Or, or others might say, well, these principles for powerful prayer that we've been talking about, they're so lofty, they're so high, they're so uh, difficult to, uh, to obtain that there's no way that I could possibly ever have these things in my life. So I can't pray powerfully, so why bother even trying? Some people say they're too busy to spend any time in prayer. When you factor in the job, and then there's the kids, and then there's the homework, and the work work, and this and that and the other, and, and by the time you add everything up with all the activities we've got going on in our lives, well, we just... Don't feel like we have the time to pray. Kind of like that poem I read to you at the start of the sermon. Martin Luther once said, I have so much to do each and every day that I have to start each day by praying for three hours. We hear a lot about marathon prayer sessions as they're sometimes called. Jesus prayed for an hour in the Garden of Gethsemane three times. Some people claim that they had spent the entire night in prayer when the burdens were great, when problems uh, during difficult times. Uh, <clears throat> we, 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 we look at these type of people and their claims and, well, we have to wonder, you know, a, you know an hour three hours, all night? What on earth did they say? I mean, how could they pray for so long? I mean, I, I think I'm doing good if I can go for five minutes without running out of things to say when I'm praying. 
Or you might say, well, I'd like to spend more time in prayer, but when I've said, it, said everything that I know to say, it still doesn't seem like I've spent enough time praying. Take heart, because if that's you, today's lesson is for you. Still others don't pray because they simply don't know how. If you feel that you don't know how to pray, rejoice because you're in some pretty good company. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, let's look at verses 1 through 4. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Even the disciples of Jesus didn't feel that they knew how to pray. So the disciples of Jesus do the very best thing that they possibly could. They catch Jesus after one of his prayer sessions and they ask him to teach them how to pray. And here's his answer, verses 2 through 4. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Jesus gives us a pattern to follow. If we follow this pattern when we pray, then we will never run out of things to say. The challenge is going to be to find the time to say them all. Uh, by following this pattern, we will know the joy. We will know the comfort. We will know the encouragement that comes from spending significant time in prayer. Now, how, might you wonder, could so short a prayer be a guide for spending more time in prayer? I mean, that's a fair question. We look at Matthew's record of this. It's a little bit longer, but it's still not super long. I mean, is it that we're supposed to say this prayer over and over and over again several different times at, in one sitting and that's how you make prayer, spend more time in prayer? I don't think so. I think that Jesus gives us an outline here. He doesn't give us the manuscript. Okay, it's an outline. An outline of, or, or a pattern for us to follow when we pray. He gives us six principles for prayer. That if followed, we will never run out of things to say to God. And the first, the first of these is make your prayers intimate. Make your prayers intimate. Now notice Jesus begins the model prayer by addressing God as Father. Father. Now to you and me, this is not a shock, okay? This doesn't come as weird or strange. I mean, if you listened to the prayers that have been prayed this morning, most of them began with the word Father or, or our Heavenly Father or something to that effect. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't shock us. It doesn't strike us as odd in the least to address God as Father. But this would shock Jesus' disciples. It would shock them because of the way that they were brought up. In their religious culture, the Jews had in a commendable effort to give God all of the respect, reverence, and honor that He deserves, they had succeeded in their zeal to separate God, to put a distance between themselves and God, between ordinary people and God. There's lots of emphasis in the Jewish uh, religion on how to, how to approach God. For the Jewish people had to be very careful about how they approach God lest they be seen to give God offense. And so in fact, the Jews would not even say the name of God. They had a, a word that they would write that was all consonants. Couldn't possibly be pronounced when they wanted to speak of God or, or, or talk of God. How many of you have ever been called into the office of a superior? Maybe a principal or an administrator. 
Maybe the CEO where you work or the, the big boss, the head cheese where you work, whatever. When you go into that person's presence, even if they're a friend of yours, you're still expected to show some sort of respect for their position. You still are expected to address them as sir or ma'am. Uh, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, you know, you call them Mr. or Mrs. I remember one summer, one of the teachers that I had at the private school that I was attending uh, worked a whole lot with the youth group uh, that, that one summer and, and all. And what, that summer, he insisted that we call him Bill. Well, I went back to school, and of course, my mom worked in the office, and so I got there early, and so I was up, going up and down the halls, and I stopped into his room, and I said, hey, Bill, how you doing? He said, Carl, I'm doing fine, but here it's Mr. Tracy. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> We're not in school hours, but anyway, no, uh, no but there, there's a certain, there's a certain protocol, a proper etiquette to addressing people, that oftentimes it doesn't allow that intimacy and doesn't allow the closeness. That's how the Jews had approached God with a, with a, in, in a fear and a reverence that didn't allow closeness, didn't allow intimacy. Think about the tabernacle and the temple. There were different parts to it. There was the courtyard that anyone could go into. There was the holy place that the priests could go into. And then there was the most holy place or the holy of holies that only the high priest could enter and that only once a year. That was a distance that was put between God and the, and the people. Well... Jesus removed the distance by using the word Father. He took it out of the way. All of a sudden, people were encouraged to approach God in an intimate and personal level. In Romans 8, verse 15, Paul writes, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, we can approach God with the word Abba. Now that word Abba is not one that we're super familiar with. Some believe it was the term used by a little child for their father, roughly equivalent to daddy, a term of affection. Now some people have taken this to an extreme, and so when they say a prayer or when they lead a prayer, they say, hey dad, it's me again. Closeness does not equal disrespect okay we can't confuse the two okay uh, and and that 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 can be seen as disrespectful to God others say it simply was a word that showed unquestioning trust in the one being addressed either way it was unprecedented to address God in such a personal intimate way and the point is that the distance has been removed that there is no distance no concern that God is removed from us. That we can approach God in an intimate and personal way. Now how does that help us to pray? Well, Francis Fenelon, a 17th century French philosopher, said this, Tell God all that is in your heart as one unloads one's heart, its pleasures and pains, to a dear friend. Tell him your troubles that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys that he may sober them. Tell him your longings that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes that he may help you conquer them. Tell him of your temptations that he may shield you from them. Tell him of the wounds of your heart that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved taste for evil, your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insincere, how pride disguises you to yourself and others. If you thus pour out all of your weaknesses, needs, troubles, there will be no lack of what to say. You will never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. 
People who have no secrets from each other never want for subjects of conversation. They do not weigh their words, for there is nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of the heart. They say just what they think. Blessed are those who attain to such familiar, unreserved intercourse with God. When we knowingly approach God in a personal and an intimate way, there is never going to be a lack of things to say to God. There's never going to be a time when we don't know what to say or, or anything. We uh, will pour it all out before God, holding nothing in reserve. And then the challenge becomes finding the time to pour it all out before God, not searching for something to say. One other point needs to be made, though, about uh, prayers being addressed to God. But it's not so much about intimacy as it is inconsistency. Somewhere along the way, we came to the mistaken impression that prayer was, quote, talking to Jesus. Maybe it's the influence of the song, just a little talk with Jesus. That makes us think that prayer is talking to Jesus. Well, Jesus is very clear, though, when he gives us this model prayer, that prayer is addressed to God. Okay? He's very clear. Now, what about Jesus? Where does Jesus fit in? Well, let's have a bit of a sidebar discussion, if you will, and understand that we pray in the name of Jesus. This is something that was taught by Jesus himself on numerous occasions. One of those occasions is John 16, verses 23 and 24. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. See, before he had not been a mediator. Now he is our mediator. But it's not only taught by Jesus himself, it's commanded by Paul. In uh, Ephesians 5 verse 20, Paul says, Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone started praying in your name. That's how they would close prayers. Maybe it was so that they didn't give offense to people who might be offended by the name of Jesus being mentioned. Nowhere in Scripture are we ever taught to pray to God in God's name. That's just not taught in Scripture anywhere. Uh, we pray to God. Prayer is addressed to God, but prayed through Jesus, our Advocate. Our mediator, 1 John 2, verse 1, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, Romans 8, verse 34, and other passages as well. Now this means more than simply adding in Jesus' name, amen, to the end of our prayers. By praying in Jesus' name, though that is important, what I mean is that we acknowledge that Jesus is the only way by which we can approach God. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Now, there's many different applications to that. One of those is if we want to approach the Father in prayer, we need to do it in Jesus' name. But more than just acknowledging Jesus as the only way we, we can approach God, we also recognize Jesus as our high priest who intercedes for us. Hebrews 7 24 and 25, John 14, 13, and again, other passages as well. So we need, when we pray, to make our prayers intimate and avoid inconsistency that is seen in some prayers that are led by people. Make your prayers intimate. Second thing we need to do for our prayers is make your prayers reflective. Make your prayers reflective. Jesus follows this intimate form of address with the words, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed, that's another one of those words that we don't really use a whole lot nowadays. Well, hallowed means to adore God, respect Him, to give Him praise and glory that He deserves. 
That's what it means to, to hallowed be your name. That's what, that's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, to accomplish this requires a period of reflection for us. It's hard to move from the world and its cares and sit down and immediately give God praise when we don't take the time to reflect on how good God really is. When we don't take the time to reflect on the ways that He's blessed our lives, the way uh, that He has blessed us with creation, uh, whatever else He has done. That's why it's so important, guys, when you're on the list to lead a prayer and you can't be here for whatever reason, you need to let Jason know ahead of time, like before just not showing up, okay? Because he needs to get somebody else and give them time to prepare themselves to lead the congregation in prayer. It's not just a simple matter of, well, you just get up here and you talk. Now, that, that's not what prayer is, and we need to understand it. We need to be able to give him praise and honor. It calls for a time of reflection. We stop and we reflect on how good God is. That's what hallowed be your name means. It means that we reflect on his goodness. We give him the praise and honor that he deserves for the goodness that he has shown to us. You know, it is good to reflect on those we love and on those that love us. It's good to do that. I've sat with people who have lost a dear family member. And I've listened to them talk about that family member. And even though their face is full of tears, you still you see the gleam in their eye when they're reflecting and they're, they're remembering that lost loved one. It's good to spend, reflect on time. And, and it, it's easy to get lost in the memories too. And even to lose complete track of time as you're talking about it and, and going through it. And, and that's good. And you know, the good times seem to be the things that we remember the most. Maybe a few bad times. But by and large, we remember the good times because those are special to us. Friends, if that's all we did in prayer, we could fill our days with prayer Th thinking about and thanking God for how good He is to us. We could pour forth our hearts in gratitude for how wonderful God has been to us and is to us. Sets Him apart from anyone and anything else. So make your prayers intimate. Make your prayers reflective. Third, make your prayers realigning. Make your prayers realigning. Jesus instructs his disciples to pray for the coming of God's rule or God's kingdom. Now we understand this to mean the church, uh, the rule of Jesus in the hearts and lives of men, uh, the coming Christian age. And when Jesus died and rose the go and the gospel was preached, then his kingdom came. And it continues to come in... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It continues to come in the sense that... Uh, more and more are added to his kingdom. But Jesus instructs his kingdom to pray, uh, his disciples to pray for God's will to be done. God's will to be done. In fact, if you look at Matthew's account, or if you look down in the footnote in Luke's account, this may, it, it's made abundantly clear. Uh, or, or more clear, I guess I should say, than, uh, th than it does just by reading the text here. That sounds a little bit odd if you stop and think about it. Praying for God's will to be done. Why should we pray for God's will to be done? I mean, <laughs> He's God, right? He's all-powerful, right? Why do we need to pray for His will to be done? Well, one reason is because oftentimes His will is not done. It's not. You hear about all the bad things going on in the world? You hear about people who, try, who, who say that they don't believe in God 
And one of the things that they come up with is, well, there's so much bad in the world. How could a good God let such bad things happen in the world? I got news for you. He doesn't, okay? That is not his will. That happened because man started imposing his own will instead of doing what is God's will. And that's why the bad things happen in the world, is man puts his will above God's will. But, uh, but he tells us to pray that his will be done. Over and over, Paul will write to his, in his letters to his readers to pray that the gospel would spread and to pray that God would help him, Paul, to preach the gospel and that, that would fall on receptive ears and in receptive hearts. All these things are things that we think would go without saying normally. Things that we would think that God would want and would do anyway. Yet we are told to pray for them. Why? Because it helps to realign our lives with God's will. Every so often, it's helpful if you get the wheels of a car realigned. Why do they need to be realigned? Because they, they, aren't, they don't always go in the same direction. Now wait a second, preacher. You've said you don't know a whole lot about cars, and this proves it. Because, I mean, I drive my car, and we're going in the same direction. The wheels are never bent out and going different ways. I'm not talking about major out of alignment. I'm talking about just you know, a fraction of a millimeter out of alignment. Your car's still going to get you where you want to go, but the tires aren't exactly spinning the same direction. And when that happens, it causes excessive wear and tear on the car, specifically on the tires. It's very important that they are going in the same direction. We can see that with cars, but it's a lot harder when it comes to our lives. So our lives can get so out of line with God's will. And when that happens, it creates excessive wear and tear on our lives. And so every so often, we need to realign our lives with God's will. When we stop and pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as the footnote here says, then we realign our lives with God's will for that day. If we repeat that on a daily basis, then we realign our will with God's will for our lives. So make your prayers realigning. Make them intimate, reflective, realigning. Number four, make your prayers relevant. Make your prayers relevant. Give us each day our daily bread. Jesus instructs us to pray for even the most basic of needs. What could possibly be more basic than one's daily bread? Just simple things, basic things. Jesus instructs us to pray for even the most obvious of things. Anything that affects us, anything that we are concerned about, Jesus invites us to pray for, about these things. Bottom line, prayer must be relevant to our lives. It must be relevant to our lives. It must mean something to us. Those struggles that we are faced with, the needs that we have, the heartaches that we feel, the sadness, the temptations. My friends, if it is important to you, it is important to God. God is our Father, after all. And what means means a lot to us means a lot to Him. There's nothing we cannot pray for. You know, there, there are things that my daughters are interested in that, y'all don't listen, I couldn't care less about. Except for the fact that my kids are interested in it. And because my kids are interested in it, I'm all over it. I'm all about it. 
I'm interested in it because they're interested in it. And folks, God is the same way. If you're interested in it, he's interested in it. He wants you to pray about it. It must be relevant to our lives. If it is important to you, it is important to God. In 1 Peter 5, verse 7, Peter writes, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He doesn't say cast most of it or just the really big important things. He says cast all all your anxiety on him what about basketball games does he really care i mean can i pray for a team to win well you got to understand that there are probably some other people cheering for the other team that are also praying for that team to win god can't say yes to both i don't think god really cares a whole lot about sports myself but if it's important to you, it's important to him. And so maybe the prayer ought to be, hey, God, help us to perform to the best of our ability. Help us to do our very best. And, and, and keep us safe. What about tests at school? Oh, yeah. Pray about those tests in school. Prepare for them, okay? Okay. Don't think that you're, you're going to have some supernatural knowledge that just pops into your head and you're going to know what the answers are. No, you've got to prepare for them, but pray about it. Pray about the things that you have to do in the course of your job at work. Pray about things that are important to you because they are important to God. Make your prayers relevant. Number five, make your prayers cleansing. Oop. Make your prayers cleansing. Forgive us our sins. Jesus knew that all of us make mistakes except Him. Okay, He didn't make mistakes. We make mistakes. He knows we make mistakes. I say things in the course of, the, of a day that I'm ashamed of. I say things I wish I hadn't said. I do things that I wish I hadn't done. I think things that I wish I hadn't thought. In the course of a normal day. I act in certain ways that I wish I hadn't acted. And in prayer, we ask God to forgive us of those things. And God forgives and we are cleansed. 1 John 1.7 says, If we are walking in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus His Son continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So we pray for God to forgive us. Excuse me. But in the process, we forgive others as well. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 is very clear in Matthew's account of this. If we don't forgive other people, God won't forgive us. Pretty simple. Pretty easy. Not so much, is it? But see, here's the thing. The, we have, there's an added benefit to forgiving others, and that is there's less physical problems. You know, a lot of times, a lot of the physical ailments that we experience can be traced back to not forgiving people, from carrying a grudge against people. Now, grudges can get pretty heavy on your back as you're carrying them around. Best thing you can possibly do with a grudge is lay it down. Forgive them. Even if they don't even ask you to forgive them, you can forgive them. Make up your mind that you're not going to carry it around anymore. At the end of the day, I ask God to forgive me and I forgive others. And there's no bitterness at all present. It's cleansing in that I am forgiven and I forgive. So make your prayers intimate. Make them reflective. Make them realigning. Make them relevant. Make them cleansing. And finally, make your prayers protective. He says, lead us not into temptation. Jesus knows, just as He knows that we're all going to make mistakes, we're going to give in to temptations. Jesus knows that we are at our strongest when we were on our knees. So ask God to protect you. Ask God to protect your loved ones. Ask God to protect your friends. All those people who are important to you. Ask Him to protect them from sin, to protect them from the evil one, to protect them from harm. Once I was at a church, 
where a brother, every time he would say a public prayer, he would always include in that prayer and be with all those who it is our duty to pray for. And I really wanted to say, okay, so who are they? You know, God doesn't want us to just make these blanket statements. He wants us to be specific about our prayers. I believe that with all my heart. So ask God to do that. Jesus, when he had his encounter with Satan in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. <coughs> excuse me. He gives, we learn the absolute best advice when we're tempted is to say, get away from me, Satan. Just tell Satan you don't have time to mess with him. Satan won't even come close when you're on your knees, when you're a prayer warrior. James 4, verse 7, James writes, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When we put these things together, and our prayers are intimate, and they are reflective, and they're realigning and relevant and cleansing and protective. There will be no lack of things to say. The challenge will be to find the time to say all the things that we need to say to God in prayer. But see, a lot of times people say, well, I can't pray because, well, you know, it's just, it, it, these things are just too tough. They're too high. They're too lofty. How on earth can anyone meet any of these conditions or all of these conditions for prayer? Well, the thing is, you can't by yourself. That's why 1 John 1 is so very important. It continually cleanses us. God is ready to help us as we pray. If we'll accept his help. This morning if there's somebody here. That hasn't had God's help. Maybe you haven't had God's help. Simply because you haven't put, him on, put on the Lord in baptism. You've not joined God's family. So he's not your father. He stands ready and willing to adopt you today. Perhaps you made that commitment, but you haven't been very faithful to that commitment. And you need the prayers of the church to, to help you be more faithful in prayer. To help you be more faithful in the, in, in the witness that you live each and every day to the people who are around you. My friends, the thing is that we can't help you if we don't know what the need is. And so we always like to give an opportunity for anyone who is here who's not right with God to make things right. Maybe that's a, a private response where you're at saying, God, I know that I need to change and please help me. But maybe it involves a public response. And if, it's, if that's the case, please don't leave here before you make that response. And if we can help you in some way, won't you come to the front as we stand and sing together?